Thank you all for coming to our fall 2015 business lecture series. Well, I'm super excited to have you. Um, a couple of things. How many of us are here just for the extra credit? And don't lie. Really? All right, all right. Well, for all of you who aren't, you're in for a really great speaker. For all of you who are, you're in for a really great speaker. So I would like to first introduce Mr. J.P. Morgan. He is a commercial photographer and director in Los Angeles, California. His unique style has developed an impressive list of clients from Paramount to McDonald's. He's a pretty awesome dude. This is one of, is this one of your pictures here? That's just, that is, that is you, but it's not one of your pictures. But he uses color like nobody's business. He was inspired by the Far Side comics and Norman Rockwell, if you know who he is. So as you can imagine, very unique very interesting. And uh, his work is so original that um, he's able to turn normal and familiar into something bizarre and humorous. So that's really cool. Uh, from his style came the highly successful photo comic and YouTube channel, The Slanted Lens. So I highly recommend you go out and check out The Slanted Lens on YouTube. Uh, he has done many, many seminars, including a platform speaker for WPPI and Photo West. He has spoken for ASMP, APA, Brooks Institute, RIT, and PPA. He's also taught at such prestigious colleges as the Art Center College of Design in Pasadena and BYU in Utah, which I think he still does uh, every, about every other semester. Oh, not he just finished, so maybe we can get him to teach here. I'm just saying. So JP continues to do assignment work, shoot stock photography for Getty Images, and DP direct commercials, which is pretty amazing. So without further ado, I welcome to the stage Mr. JP Morgan. Well, thank you very much. I hope you can hear that. Now, first things first, before I go do anything else, I'm going to just do a little uh, Periscope thing here. So I'm uh, periscoping here, and welcome to Glendale College, everybody. Yeah? <laughs> so uh, just doing a little, uh, there we go, there we go. And just doing a little, uh, little business kind of introduction to what J.P. Morgan does in the Slanted Lands with Glendale College, so it's great to be here. And so uh, check us out on Periscope and all those other things. I just had to do that. Because the lady who does my uh, social media said, please, just do that, will you? Please. <laughs> so, and the last thing, and I'll get this out of the way, and then we'll go on here, is I'm going to take a, a selfie of us here. <laughs> there we go. And I love that. And flip my phone. I'm just taking, there we go. All right, that looks awful. And let's go on. <laughs> I... I was raised in a little tiny town in Blackfoot, Idaho. Uh, there was about 10,000 people in the town that I lived in. Uh, I was raised on the outskirts of town, uh, kind of semi-farm life. My grandparents had a farm. And I knew from a very early age that there was no way on this earth that I was going to stay in Idaho. It just was not the place for me, not that I don't love Idaho. Now as I get older, I say I'd love to go back to Idaho, but I always say I would miss my wife because uh, she's not going to go. <laughs> So, in that process, though, I learned several things. At your age, I was sitting in a math class at Brigham Young University, and I was sitting there looking at the teacher and thinking to myself, I don't have a clue what he's talking about. I mean, I don't have a clue what he's talking about. So I went up to the teacher afterwards, and I said, you know, I don't get, I don't get any of this. And he goes, well, why don't you try a, a different math class? So I went to the math class under the one that I was in. After a day or so of that, I'm going, I don't get a clue. And so the, the, the teacher said, go to Math 100A, and this will help you, because obviously you don't think like math. And so go to 100A. So I went to 100A. I sat down in the class, and the teacher said, OK, I'm, I'm going to go really fast here, but I'm going to start very basic. So here we go. 1 plus 1 equals 2. Is everybody with me? I'm going, this is my class. <laughs> <laughs> These are my people. <laughs> And I was able to get through that math experience. I remember a, t a time at, uh, in high school, my uh, English teacher pulled me aside. She saw me out in town, little town, you see everybody. She goes, JP, just remember that spelling has nothing to do with intelligence. 
you are an intelligent person. I go, well, thank you. I appreciate hearing that because I can't spell. I still can't spell. I, when I write, I have to have someone proofread it and check it. But the reason I'm saying all this is I'm going to talk to you today from the point of view who some, from someone who does not think in your normal business person way. I'm not a math person. I'm not an English person. I'm a creative person. My desires are for creative things. The way I see the world is from a creative point of view. I do not see things from an accounting point of view. I see things from a very different point of view. So if there are people out here like this, in this group today, I'm going to help you see some ways to be able to make it in the world of creative endeavors. And it's not an easy world to make it in. It's a very difficult world. But because you don't do math and you don't do English and those kinds of things extremely well does not mean that you do not have the ability to be very successful in business and to have a successful experience in a creative pursuit. So we'll talk a little bit about that. There we go. JP Morgan Pictures is a company that I started uh, when I left Art Center College Design. Who am I? I got a BFA from, in photography uh, at uh, Art Center College of Design after I had gotten a BA in photography or well, communications from uh, Brigham Young University. I realized when I got my degree from Brigham Young University that there's no way that I'm going to be able to make a living with the education I just got. Now, this is a creative pursuit, so I'm wanting to do commercial photography, commercial advertising, and, and film. And I just, I'm thinking to myself, I've got to get further education. So I came here to Los Angeles. I went to Art Center College of Design. Incredible experience. They beat me up for four years. I was so, it's one of those experiences that you're so glad you did, and I'm so glad I don't have to do again. At Art Center, I knew that I loved Norman Rockwell. I loved the far side. I loved the far side. I think it was the funniest cartoon ever done. And so I started to kind of incorporate these kinds of large set production kinds of things. This was a, a project I shot as a student at Art Center College of Design. So my wife and I built the set uh, in a big cove there. That's my brother's uh, rock band on the bottom. That's my brother here. And uh, we got a little lady who lived next door to come and be in the photograph. And that was one of my first photographs where I'm going, hey, I love this. I mean, there is something inside of me that just gets so excited when I look at this. Do I love the process? No. Sometimes I hate the process. Do I love the outcome? Absolutely. I just die for the outcome. The outcome is just what fuels my whole world. So I just, oh, I tried to work for other photographers when I left Art Center. But I had started to shoot these big sets and these kind of big pieces, investing every penny we had. Don't think there's a mom and dad with a lot of money behind that. My wife was working as a graphic designer to try to help pay our bills. And so we're trying to scrape together money. So I'm going, you know what? We're not going to be able to have a lot of money for food this month. But hey, we're going to get a great photograph. <laughs> and so we would spend money on, on props, on wardrobe, and all those kinds of things. So the thing that I found out, though, working for another photographer, is he looked at my portfolio and he said, hey, this is great stuff. I'd like to hire you because I want to learn how to do this stuff. And I'm thinking to myself, well, I don't want to do that. So I started my own business in 1987. I took out a loan for $13,000 from a little credit union in Idaho. And I thought I had all the money in the world. You know, there's no way we could have any problems now. We've got $13,000, you know. I went to this little studio place. We've got a studio down at a place called The Brewery that's right off from Main Street and the 5 Freeway. And at the office, I rented a 3,500 square foot studio space. And he said, I'll need $9,000 for your first months, last months, and your uh, deposit. I'm going, $9,000? I now have $4,000 after one check. And I realized with that $4,000, this is the best decision that I have ever made in my entire life. I can buy equipment. I can, or I can try to buy clients. And so what I did was I started a calendar. We would print this kind of an image on the front of a black and white uh, image on the front of an envelope. It's a calendar. And then inside, it had this crazy image that was going on. And we mailed out 4,000 of these. I found a, a, a printer, and I said, look, I'll do the calendar artwork, because my wife's a graphic designer. I'll take the images. All you have to do is find a paper company who will uh, pitch in the paper, and you print them, and we'll mail out these every month. So I decided, hey, if I do a calendar one time and they love it, then that's great. They put it up on the wall. If they hate it, they throw it away. I'm going, if they hate my calendar, I'm going to make them hate it 12 times, because <laughs> I'm going to mail it to them every single month for a year. And so we did these crazy shots. When I did this shot here, we had been shooting a little project for another person. He got a tiger to come in. So I, I uh, worked with a person. I said, hey, look, I want to do a shot for myself at the end of the day. And I want to do a shot of this tiger in this bathtub. And the guy said, no problem. We'll put the tiger in the bathtub for you. 
And so when it came time to do it, he brought the tire in from the front. The tire put his legs in the bathtub. And the guy's going, I, I can't get it any further than that. And I'm going, well, get the thing in there. You know, push it in there. And he goes, you push it in there if you want it in there. <laughs> and I'm going, well, I don't want to push it. So he said, let's try a different tiger. So we got a different tiger. We had two of them there. And he had warned me that tigers like to spray, which basically means to mark their territory. So I'm pushing this cage in. And all I remember is this tiger backs up to me. And I'm going, oh, that's the tiger's tail. And then the tiger's tail went up <laughs> right in my face. All down me. And I'm going, I was furious because we couldn't get the tiger in the bathtub. And I'm going, your tiger just peed all over me, man. And he's going, oh, we'll get in there, Mr. Morgan. We'll get in there. So we cut a hole in the back of the set and pulled him in from behind. And we got the shot. When I got home that night, my cat freaked out. <laughs> had no idea what had just moved in to the house. So that's the thing we did every month, every month. We would send those things out every month, and it was a fascinating experience because we would get a call and somebody would say, hey, I've got this little project, and I'm not sure if you're going to want to do it or not. It's not very big. You know, we only got X number of dollars. Would you be interested in shooting it? And we're thinking, we'll shoot anything. <laughs> we will shoot anything. Uh, we're starving to death. And we immediately had this sense that we were on this, this really, we were very established. We were shooting huge imagery. You know, the investment we'd made all through art school was paying money to create large production shots was now paying off. I shot this one just as we left art school. I went down to then, then in uh, South Pasadena, or in Pasadena, we rented spaces on the main drive of Colorado for $300 a month. So the Apple store, that was my studio for $300 a month. And, but we had plywood boarded up on the front. There was no one down there. And so I built this little set in the, the space down there. But the deal was we had to get out you know, within 24 hours notice. We were kind of just there holding the space for them. So we built this set. I built it on edge like that. The lady's holding on to the, the, uh, the ceiling. That's how she's in place. These are all done in one photograph. Most of you are going, oh, he just did that in Photoshop. These are all done as one single image on film. And so I had to put her in that place. As I was sitting there shooting her and her husband, the little boy was kind of sitting on the side. And I said, hey, will you hold on to your mom's leg? Will you hang on to her leg while I do this picture? He's going, no, no. And his mother's going, are you kidding me? And I'm going, it'll look great. So I just grabbed him. I said, hold on, or I'm going to let go of you. And he grabbed a hold of her leg. And I got, I got two shots. And that was it. I sent that image out. And immediately we got responses from Pizza Hut. And they said, hey, we absolutely love the image. We want to do a shot like that. So we now built this great big setup here. Uh, we cut out kind of a thing to give us an idea where our person's going to go. We got fishing line that's dropping all of the different items that are flying in the shot. We got a little thing up here with our lights coming through. And there's our, our shot. As I was shooting this, I had three children there. And I learned a great lesson that when you have three children there, you should make sure that they're not all in the same room at the same time. Because there was just a little kind of harness for this child to sit in. We'd kind of become a little more sophisticated than the beginning. And the child grabbed a hold of it on there and put the child in, freaked out, started crying, and the mother had to take him off. And so the next child came in, started crying before he even got up there. He's going, hey, I saw what happened to the last guy. I'm not even going in. You know? So I grabbed my son and I said, listen, Jared, I will give you anything you want if you'll just sit in that harness. He goes, anything? Anything. He goes, how about a RoboCop figure? I'm looking at my wife going, how much? She's going, $4. Going, you drive a hard bargain, buddy, but you're in. You're in. <laughs> and so I remember the last thing is I did this shot yelling at him, look up her dress, Jared, look up her dress. So he's <laughs> pretty much destroyed for life, I'm sure. <laughs> As I was pulling this set down, I stood on it and I thought, oh, my word, I can defy gravity if the set's not all the way on the floor yet. If I nail my shoes to the floor, I can create this kind of weird world. Now, this is a really good example of why it is I am not an artist. <laughs> this is my sketchbook. This is an image from my sketchbook I drew before I did this next shot. And to me, it makes perfect sense. To everyone else, they're going, what in the world is that? <laughs> For me, it makes perfect sense. Translates into that. I called a next door neighbor and I said, hey, I need your dog to be, or no, I called a dog trainer. I said, I need your dog to be in this little harness, got a sweater that goes over it. Well, it uh, there's a, po a post that goes straight back to the wall there. I said, I need your dog to be in our, I, I need a dog to be in the photograph. And the dog trainer said, there's no way. I'll, I'll never get my dog to do that. So I called my neighbor. Hey, well, I, I want to take a picture of your dog. He goes, that sounds great. <laughs> and uh, his dog did fine. <laughs> 
That's how that shot was done. Entirely built in one shot. His boots are nailed to the floor. I redid this little thing with Donnie Marie on a TV show that they had when it was playing to put them in a place, have them leaning in, blowing on a Christmas tree and some stuff like that when I had my book that came out. So there's the whole crew that worked on it. That's how it was photographed. I just thought it was funny, you know, the far side, the little chicken stealing the uh, baby, and I thought, how about we have chimps stealing a baby? I don't want to do too many of these here. Um, anyway, I just thought it was funny. My wife goes, that is sick. Okay, okay, sick is not good, but how about a chimp that's like lifting up a lady's dress and laughing? Is that funny? She goes, that's still kind of sick, but <laughs> I thought it was funny. <laughs> so... These chimps do this. <laughs> I was like, we, I, shot, I had just finished shooting one of those really bad chimp calendars, you know, where they're in suits and things. I mean, it was just embarrassing to even say, but, you know, but hey, you know, you got to pay the bills. And so uh, we did that, that shot with the chimps. I just, the, this is my world. I have colitis, so I've been in the proctologist's office many times. And I thought, why does a person do this for a living? I don't understand. <laughs> so there's my ode to proctology. So. <laughs> On the other side of the set, all these animals are stuck through because we just cut holes in the wall and stuck them through. They're all, these are made by a place called Jim Bolden's Animals of Distinction, so they're all artificial animals. And we're just sticking them through the wall there, so I just thought it was funny. I just finished uh, shooting this for a, uh, a movie poster, and uh, I just thought, we got the toilet, we got the lady, she's plunging, she shoots her husband off the, the toilet and shoots him in the ceiling. I just thought it was funny stuff. So. I, you know, it's, at the time I was doing these things and someone once said, well, your stuff is like, it's not very real. I'm going, oh, really? <laughs> you think that comes as a shock to me? <laughs> it's cartoons. So I started doing this as a cartoon. I ran a cartoon in about 50 newspapers. It's called The Slanted Lens. And it would run once on Sundays. And I would put these in with these little, uh, little tag lines. So there's the set and how we shot that. Took a bear out, put him in a boat. We got a little, uh, a little thing here that keeps this boat out in the water. And we got this little bear we put in the back of the boat. And uh, he would wave. The guy's going, he'll wave. But if he moves up towards this fish, he said, don't let him see the fish. So I kept using that. The little kid in the back, I'd go, he sees a fish. The kid's go, <laughs> and I'd shoot. And he goes, perfect. <laughs> no. Crazy stuff. There's a, a, a metal structure that goes from here, down his arm, surfboard back down here to a, a stand, and that guy's just laying on that structure. So it's a single photograph. You see the... It's an artificial shark. Yes, I know. <laughs> and uh, the, the guy said, don't get it wet or the fins will all fall off. I'm going, oh, we got it so wet. When we pulled it out of that thing, all the fins fell off. And I'm going, great. I'm going to have a finless shark on the side of my wall for the rest of my life, you know, $1,200. But my painting guy, he put him in there and painted him up and get a lacquer on him. The guy goes, wow, the shark looks better than we've ever seen him. I did this for a computer company. They said, you know, I, we want to do a high-density uh, computer disk. And so I, we shot these uh, sumo on a set of skis. And that's been the image that I make the most money on of anything I've ever shot. All of these images, when I photograph them, I retain the rights to them. And so now I've put these with Getty Stock, which is a stock company, or I put them with small stock companies so I can sell them as stock. We've got to get past these and get into kind of the process of, of running your business here. So anyway, there's, we had to do a double density, two sumos on skis. Yeah, that's not easy. I mean, that's a, there's a, one post. This double post back here is holding both those dudes up. <laughs> that's a single image. Uh, you know, I look at it now and I'm going, oh, I am, there's, I am too tired to ever even try to do that. <laughs> so, but I would always take these sets after I shot them for somebody else, and I would try to create something for myself. And so I would shoot these different shots on these sets when we were done. I shot this whole series for a computer company called Cadence. Had these gorgeous sets that we built. So these are all built. An entire recre recreation of Edward Hopper's Nighthawks. And so we would put all the talent in it, and I did this shot. This is a greeting card that's made me thousands of dollars because it sells every Christmas. It sells and sells and sells. At the end of the day, I came in, and my son was here, uh, my wife and my two daughters there, and me and my other daughter here, and we did a family portrait of us in this little scene. And then we ate pizza in the, uh, in the scene, and then we tore it down the next day. It's like that one photograph was about 50... 50 some odd plus dollars, 50,000 dollars, not 50 dollars, yeah, 50 dollars. Yeah. <laughs> you just gotta see the set.
Okay, a couple more of these and I'll get on something else. <laughs> Tape company, the guy said, we want to shoot this, it's ad says, uh, Charlie told me to stick it, so I did. So, uh, you know, I didn't come up with the copy line, I just did the photograph. Uh, this is not a real cat, although I tried to tape my real cat up, no, I didn't. <laughs> it's a synthetic cat. Just had a harness for the guy on the wall, put him up there. I try to end these things, as many of these things, this is my wife's name, this says Morgan Paving. Anytime there's a fridge in a shot for Domino's, for pizza, anything like always my kids' shot uh, images go up on the fridge. I do that as many times as possible. I always, for a long time, I had a, hit a point. This is a movie poster for Judge Reinhold. He was fabulous. I, sh I shot this stuff on 4x5 sheet film. So I'm doing one sheet of film at a time. And I ran out of film. We'd shot so much. But he was in such a groove. He's going, JP, get this. Then he'd go, JP, how about this? And I had no film. I just kept turning the holder back and forth. Looking great. Just kept shooting him for about, you know. <laughs> just, but uh, he was too excited to stop, so. Hey, I played this, I had that piano book. I hated the piano. That was my ode to playing the piano, so. Okay, you get the point. We're gonna move on to some other things here. Get past this here. Okay, I'll show you this last one. I love making fun of Santa Claus. Uh, this is Santa Claus out of the back of his sleigh. That was my drawing, then I thought, well, Maybe it's like he gets taken out by a TV antenna. <laughs> so that was kind of fun. I have another one that says, don't drink and drive, and he's drunk, and his sleigh's crashed into a billboard. I thought that was hilarious, but some people were a little offended by that. <laughs> <laughs> when Santa Claus showed up, he did not have a leg. He came in on crutches without, I'm going, Bill, what happened to your leg? I just saw you on Thursday. And he goes, no, I have a prosthetic leg. I, I had no idea, because it was hurting me today, so I didn't bring it. You know, Bill, most people kind of think of Santa as two legs, you know. <laughs> It's a cultural thing, you know, <laughs> and I'm going. So we had to take and, and we nailed a two by four and put a boot in there for his other leg. <laughs> okay, creating a style is a really interesting thing. If you want to make it in the creative world, there's a couple of things you need to do to create a foundation to make this a positive experience. The first is you've got to have a point of view. A point of view is probably the most important thing you'll ever develop if you want to be successful. Now, in that process, there's an easy way to create a point of view. And there's several things I put here. And if you'll do a self-exploratory experience where you take these different things, put them on a piece of paper, and write down a complete list of what do I love. And I'm not talking about in the creative world. I'm not saying I love this artist, I love that. No, what do you love? I had a photographer friend of mine, actually he's an assistant of mine, going, you know, I just can't make it in the photo world. This is not working for me. I can't get jobs. And I'm going, Dave, what do you love? He goes, what do you mean, what do I love? I, what do you love? He goes, I love mountain biking. I know you do. You go every weekend. You go every night. You go, I mean, you, you eat and drink mountain biking. Why are you not photographing mountain bikes? Why are you not photographing people riding mountain bikes? Why are you not photographing the, the machinery, the mechanics? Why are you not doing that? And at that point, he started doing all that, and his, his career exploded. So what do you love is the beginning point of creating a, a, a point of view. Uh, what are your hobbies? That was Dave's, the mountain biking. What are the things that you, you love to do when you don't have to do anything else? Uh, what do you have access to? It's fascinating because you'll find people, like Herb Ritz is a great example, and you probably don't know who Herb Ritz is, but he shot a lot of celebrities, probably one of the premier uh, celebrity shooters through the 90s, but he had access to all these people because he came from a wealthy family, his father was a producer, and he just rubbed shoulders with all these people. So the fact that Herb Ritz became a famous celebrity photographer there's no, there's no accident there. He had access, you know? So what do you have access to? What do you have the ability to get a hold of and to photograph and to, to paint and do all those kinds of things? What kinds of photography and video do you like? What is it that you love? What do you love to do? What, what gets you excited? What do you think really respond to? Make a list of those things and look at those things. What type of person are you? If you tell me, I really want to be a celebrity person, but I just, I'm so shy, I just don't like to talk to people. I'm going, you're gonna have a hard time. You're gonna have a very difficult time making that happen. You know, you might find a different place in this industry, this world, that will be better suited to your personality. Uh, you know, I don't work well with products. The reason I don't work well with products is because they don't have to go home. And so they can sit there and stare at me all night long, and so it never feel, it feels like it ends. I can always make it better. I can always do something else to it. And so I don't feel like I, I can ever say it's done. But for me, models show up, I've got them for three hours. It's costing me $500 to $1,000 an hour for these people to be on set. And I've got to be done in three hours, and they've got to go home. And that means there's an end point for me. It fits my personality. It helps me to be, be focused. And I never make a decision until I have to, because I'm a creative person. You know, oh, I can't decide that. I'm not under any stress yet. You know, and so when the stress comes, I finally make decisions. And then talent does that for me. 
So this becomes the foundation of your point of view. For me, and I'll just go through a couple of these things here. Uh, well, OK. You can't, I say shoot, 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 draw, 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 paint, 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 whatever that creative pursuit is, you can't do enough of it. You have to eat it, you have to drink it, you have to sleep it. I remember one day saying to my wife, Jillian, I was going, hey, Jillian, all I want for my birthday, all I really want, is I just want to do this great photograph with these people and all these kind of things. And it's just, I mean, I just want the day just be about me doing this photograph. She's going, that's every day. <laughs> you know, what, was every day your birthday? You know, it's like, and I, I was thinking, well, this feels different. <laughs> I don't know why. But you can't shoot enough. You just cannot, you can't exercise this muscle enough. You can't do enough of it to be able to move ahead. I love the saying by Henry Cartier Barson that your first 10,000 photographs are your worst. So you've got to keep doing this. You've got to keep shooting. You've got to keep working it and, and moving ahead. So uh, my style is a combination of things. I love Norman Rockwell. I love this guy by the name of Reed Miles. Reed Miles did these really great, this is the album covers for Chicago back in the day. He did these great images of just kind of a Rockwell type imagery. And I love Rockwell. I love the, he would do these photographs. And I love looking at these photographs. I have every one of them that he's ever done. And that from those he would paint. And so I love this world of, of a slice or a moment of life and what's going on there. But I realized at that point, there's so many photographers out there that were doing that at that moment. I didn't want to be that. I didn't want to do that. I want to do something a little different. So the far side became my ingredient that mixed that up because I wanted this thing to be a little more irreverent. I wanted this thing to be a little more edgy. And so I started doing these kinds of weird uh, images like this that we showed you earlier. And it became, that was my, really, my kind of my point of view, my direction. Production, when I say this, production doesn't just happen, you make it happen. Uh, this is an image done by a person by the name of Rodney Smith, very incredible photographer. If you've never seen Rodney Smith, you should look him up. Does incredible fine art photography. And when I looked at this photo, I was in his home, it was on his wall, he lives in New York City. And I said, Rodney, did you pre-visualize that? He goes, no, I didn't pre-visualize that at all. I said, no, come on. He said, it was serendipitous, it just happened. I'm going, really? He goes, yeah. I said, so tell me what happened with the photograph. He said, well, we hired a barge to float down the river in, in, uh, in New York. We had got all these models, and I had racks of wardrobe sitting there with a wardrobe person. And so we're sitting on this barge, and we're going by the buildings in the background. And I think to myself, oh, I can get them stacked just like the World Trade Center. And I, I've got umbrellas. Who's got umbrellas? And I take this picture. I'm going, Rodney, this is not serendipitous. You rented a barge. <laughs> You've got all kinds of wardrobe. You found the talent. Now, the moment and what you create there may become serendipitous, but the foundation's been laid for that experience to happen. And that's exactly what he had done. <laughs> so in this process, for me, it was interesting because I just, I moved from this, because my stills were so fast, the motion was so much a part of them, they said, well, we want you to do, uh, we want you to start to shoot commercials for us. So I started this kind of my style morphed into commercials. And that's a point I really want to make with you in the creative industry, don't turn anything down. I remember sitting with a, a gal that I photographed for all of her Showtime specials. Her name was um, Elaine Bouchler. And probably no one here knows the name of Elaine Bouchler. Elaine Bouchler was a comedian in the 80s into the 90s. And she had all kinds of Showtime specials, did incredibly well in Vegas. But she turned down three sitcoms because they just weren't right for her. And I remember sitting with her at one time. She said, JP is the dumbest thing I ever did in my life. I should have accepted every single one of them. So in the creative industry, you just accept what it hands you. You do it. You make it. You don't get in this sense of, no, I only do certain things. Do the things that you're accepted as long as you're morally OK with it. And it'll help your career to grow and move on to other things. So this is just a, this is just a quick, I'll make this quick here. And this is a retrospective of some of my film work. A lot of this is SD work before it goes into HD work. It was fun making a desk out of Jello.
but moving on. So in that process, so my career kind of morphed into not just doing stills, but also doing a lot of video work. I still shoot a lot of video work. I DP and DP direct, which means I'm in charge of not just the camera, but uh, directing and the camera work. That's what a DP or director of photography is. Uh, but I still do stills. You know, I still do a lot of stills. I don't do a lot of portrait kinds of things. I mean, people ask me occasionally, and I will shoot them. But mostly, I, I have the other people I have to do that. But I. I started to think, I just on a fluke started a thing called The Slanted Lens, a YouTube channel. It's got over 150,000 followers now. And I just, one of my art director friends said, hey, do a BTS shot. Show us how you do your photographs. And so I did one. I put it on YouTube. It got like 5,000 hits. And I'm going, wow, this is interesting. And so I just started putting these things up. Now it's become a, a business. I charge uh, sponsors to sponsor the channel. I, uh, you know, so it actually, it makes us a lot of money. My wife and I just got back from Gettysburg. We went there and photographed last week. We had a Lincoln lookalike there. We did several shots at Gettysburg. It was all written off as, as part of the Slanted Lens thing. So it was a fun thing. Hi, this is JP Morgan. Today on the Slanted Lens, we're here on Wall Street. We're out on location at the Ultimate Graveyard. We're going to take you into a preschool. It's just fun because I get to shoot whatever I want to shoot. We're going to talk about snoots today. We're going to take a look at the different diffusion material that Roscoe makes. We're going to show you how to create a snow rig that gives you a really nice even blanket of falling snow. White Yeti on a gray background to make it easier for us to outline them. TVs melt and fall apart when you light them on fire. I found that out. Who would have thought? Fire! That was fun. We went back to, we go back to East every every fall because we like the fall colors. We always come up with an excuse to shoot something with a slant lens back there. So we're gonna see if we can shoot up the town just a little bit. Yeah, you'll never catch me, Kappa. And then we're going to show you some of the bicycle shots. This is a meme on the internet that's been like a million times or more. You're flapping your jaw. All right, anyway, we're going on. So I've kind of moved into this more whimsical stuff. I do a lot of this kind of whimsical, almost becomes, uh, uh, I call it fantasy portraits. And uh, it's a lot of fun. OK, so I'm going to go on here. Uh, if, unless your creative industry and creative pursuits are a hobby, they need to make money for you. And there's a couple of things you can do to make that happen here. I'm going to go through really quickly in video and photography some of the ways you can make money. And it's an interesting perspective here because the market has changed so much. Uh, first off, you have an incredible insurgence in weddings. It's fascinating. The one time that people will spend money for a photographer is weddings. They truly will. And not just weddings, uh, still photography, but video as well. But the photographers and videographers out there who are making that happen are individuals who are showing neat, incredible style. And they also are incredibly, they are great people to be with. Who wants to have a wedding photographer at their day who's just difficult to deal with, who doesn't blend in and make the day a great experience? But there's great money in weddings. This kind of thing was never heard of before. And I didn't do this with an interview someone else did. But it's like this pre-wedding uh, interview. They now have pre-wedding bridles, but it's like people are doing fancy portraits with pre-wedding bridles. I mean, that whole industry is exploding. It's really fascinating. Um, then just your basic portraiture. My daughter-in-law does portraits of, she just took pictures of her, her kids, puts them on Instagram, puts them on Facebook, and puts them around. Pretty soon all of her friends are asking her to take pictures of their kids. And, all, and organically, she's created a market and a way to make a living that's really fascinating. I had a, a person, I was at BYU, and BYU is the world's capital for marriages. Uh, and so there I'm going, I'm going, why are you not doing wedding photography? And they said, well, you know, I'm just not really sure if I want to. And then midway through the semester, they said, you know, I think I'm going to do the wedding thing. I said, you've got to do everything you possibly can, social media. You live in the capital of this. Within a year, this person had gone from never shot, in a, we shot a wedding to doing 40 weddings last year and making a significant amount of money. But two things that she did that were really fascinating to me. One is she is very polished. And she has a nice presentation when she goes out and she talks about the work that she does. And she also worked the social media thing to death. I mean, she just worked it to death. And that's uh, been really the, the secret to this, that process. Video is the visual frontier of your generation right now. It's happening right this very second. On the web, everywhere, you've, you've had a still image that doesn't move. We're in the process of all that's got to change and that everything now has to be video. 
We see it with Facebook taking on video and taking really YouTube on head to head. So if you're interested in video on any level, there is a market out there where you can make money. Everybody needs a video. Companies need training videos. They need introduction videos. They need every single thing they do has a video component to it now and they need that work done. They need it immediately. It's not a hard thing to get into. It's not a hard thing to understand, but you do have to, you've got to gain the skills. If you, and here's the other thing I'll say about this thing before I go on to editorial. I don't advocate at all. I don't advocate people who are in college that say, well, let's leave college, go find a photographer and go work with them. I think education is the most important thing you can possibly do. You've got to get your associate's degree from Glendale College, no doubt about that. Get that done in your life. Don't think twice about it. Don't look back. Don't ever think about it. Get it done. And then get to a college that represents the, the visual pursuit you want to, to uh, proceed uh, and to do. Uh, I started Art Center, and I've got people trying to do their general education on the weekends while we're carrying this full load at Art Center. It was killing them. So you, getting your GEs done here lays a foundation for going to a place like Art Center. It lays a foundation for going to Canyon uh, a School uh, that has a great arts program. There's places in Long Beach. There's other places. So get this done. Get it done as quickly as you can, and, and you can get on to the next step in that process. There's all kinds of work in editorial work. It's not as much as it used to be. That market's shrinking a little bit. It's not as strong as it has been, but there's still a market there. Corporate work is still there for still photography, but I think it's growing into a, a video market more and more. You don't want to just see a picture of the CEO. What is he, every time now, who, since Lee Iacocca started it, every CEO wants to be the spokesperson now. You know, they want to be a personality. Well, you see that in all of these things we do. Specialize. Here's a gal that was in a business class that I took. She said, I love doing these little kind of uh, business class that I taught. She said, I love doing these little uh, quick times for uh, Instagram. And so she did a few of these. And they just, I think, I think this one will play here. She did so much of that stuff. She would put it on her Instagram. She found a, a gal who loved a scrapbook. She shot, shot stuff for the gal who loved a scrapbook. Pretty soon she's doing this all over the place. She called me a month ago and she goes, JP, I don't even know what to do, but Pinterest called me today and they want me to shoot all of their stuff for their new advertisement for Thanksgiving and Christmas. She goes, I don't know where to begin. Do I charge them $1,500? I'm going, for your assistant, you know, it's like, there's no way. You're gonna charge them between $35 and $4,500 a day for the three weeks that they use you to shoot their stuff. And you're gonna make what you're supposed to make because you paid the price. You've shown a great style, they love you. Brides Magazine has her doing stuff for them. Pinterest has got doing, she's just, she's exploded because she just keeps doing it. She's repetitive, she's got a point of view. She keeps getting it out there. She's making incredible money. She hasn't even finished college yet. She's getting, doing her last class. This uh, will end here at the end of this semester. But she's got a, a point of view. This young man was loved outdoor photography. So he said, I'm not gonna just go out and take pictures of the outdoors, but I'm gonna take pictures of people using gear. And so he has got these great images that show this point of view of people using gear all over the world. He'll go to India. He chooses a travel companion he knows is great and will photograph well, and they travel all of India, and he photographs this person in different situations. He's got a great channel, or a great page that's up. His name is Harvey Logan, and he started to get all these clients, like all your Columbia, all your outdoor people. Are, they see it. They see the point of view. They see how they can use him, and that he's specialized enough to make that work for him. Okay. We talked about all these things here. This is fascinating to me. This gal is really fascinating. I mean, her name is um, Joanna DeGener DeGeneres, and yes, she is married to Ellen DeGeneres' brother. But before that, she was just, she has a garage door, a garage. She opened the door to her garage, and she realized, oh, it's nice light coming in. I'm gonna put a backdrop here, and I'm gonna do pictures of my model friends. And so in doing that, she shot a few of them for friends. Friends liked them. They talked to other friends. Pretty soon more people are doing them. And uh, now she charges, uh, I think, $1,300 a setting. A setting takes two hours. She does four a day, and she's booked every single day of the week. And this happened before she married into the DeGeneres family. It was just her organic. She's a great person. She reached out to all of the different talent agencies. She, she, she hustled her work. You have to hustle your work. I tell photographers I talk to and I coach, you can't spend the day, you can't think you're working on your career when you look at uh, all your favorite websites in the morning. No, you are working on your career when you're calling people trying to get work. That's how you get, that's how you're gonna move ahead. 
This gal out of Florida has these little cameras she clips on people when they come there for vacation. And then they walk around and they're on all the time. They're like a, a GoPro type camera. They take, well, they take pictures every so often. And then she puts them into a book and gives them a book called Your Vacation. So these people show up, she clips cameras on them, waves, they come back on Friday, she takes the cameras off, she puts it into a book, sends it to them, charges them several thousand dollars. And she's doing really well. So is that a market that I would have said uh, three years ago, yeah, make sure you get the camera clip market going. No, that's something she created, that world. She created that because of the things she's done. Senior portraits have exploded. I, I am just dumbfounded by that. Me, I got that goofy picture with the big afro, you know, when I was a senior, and that was it. That was called a senior portrait, you know? But now they're doing fantasy portraits. They're doing, I mean, they're just doing all kinds of stuff. And a person who will advertise and get into Instagram can, can really make a ton of money in singer, singer, uh, senior portraits. Okay, I told my daughter this when she came to me. My daughter Jamie, she said, Dad, I wanna be a photographer. I said, you know what, Jamie? If there's anything else you would rather do, <laughs> do it. <laughs> because this is not an easy way to make a living. But if this is what you love, and this is what you just have to do, then you should do it. But if you're gonna do it, get in all the way. You know, get the education you need. You know, work hard at this. This, is not a, this cannot be a casual experience in your life. And if you'll do that, you can be successful in the arts. And so, in saying that, one of the worst things that creatives do is they don't value what they create. First off, you create it, and the first thing you think is, will anybody like it? Will anyone love my baby? You know? And so, when someone says, I'll give you a dollar for your picture, you're thinking, wow, someone loves it. <laughs> and you're going, thanks, great. But the reality is we don't value what we create. So learn to put value on what you create. If you can't do this, then associate yourself with someone who will put value on what you create. Take business classes. I, in the last two years, three years, have done video uh, kind of interviews of dentists and doctors and pharmacists and, I mean, just across the board. And you know what every single one of them has said when I ask them, give me a tip about business? Every single one of them has said, I wish I'd taken business classes. Dentists, I wish I'd taken business classes. Doctors. I wish I'd taken business classes. If you want to succeed in the industry, in the arts, take business classes. Because in the end, you're going to need to run a business. You're going to need to understand overhead. You're going to need to understand what it means to have a profit and loss statement. You're going to need to understand all those things. Take business classes. I think one of the most important things you do is find a mentor. Find someone who loves it. Uh, there's a kid that came to me, and I'll, I'll give this perspective a little bit, but Shaheem, I bumped into him at... <laughs> and, uh, Trader Joe's in La Cunada. And he goes, hey, I recognize you from the Slanted Lens. I'm going, you know, thanks, it's great. You know, and he goes, yeah, I love your stuff. I really want to be a photographer. I want to do this. You know, I go, sure, yeah, I'm sure you do. You know, <laughs> and he goes, no, I really do. I want to do this. And I said, well, come and be on set with us then. Come and, and work with us. He goes, okay, I'll call you. I thought, I thought, well, that's the last time I'll hear from him. Next day, several emails. Please, let me work on a shoot, on a shoot with you. <laughs> Shaheem came. He was fabulous. I mean, the kid is 16, he didn't know that much, but he was A, on time, he was willing to work hard, he was there to do whatever we wanted him to do, and he was so excited and so engaged, I'm going, hey, have this kid back, you know? And Shaheem's worked with us several times. Uh, this afternoon, I'll write a letter for him to get accepted at Art Center, and that's the next step for him. He's gonna get some more education. But that, a mentor, I will be in some way probably associated with him and help him as he moves along in that process. So find a mentor. Find somebody that is doing the type of creative pursuit that you want to do and mentor yourself after them and be a part of their world. If you don't know how to find this person, join a club that has the same kind of people that you want to become like. You know, find a group, an organization or something where you can find individuals, you can connect with them and find someone to mentor. Sometimes you do need to work for free. And what Shaheem did for me was, was just fabulous. He worked, he did it for free, now I, I'll pay the kid. You know, I mean, he's just, he's fabulous. He's fabulous because he works hard. That's the one thing. I cannot tell you the number of people who have come and worked for free for me who didn't work hard. And at the end of the day, I'm going, boy, you just kind of missed the whole point here. You had an opportunity and you didn't prove yourself. You had an opportunity to come here and to show that you really had what it takes. All you have to show is that you have a great desire and you work hard. I don't care how much you know. I'll show you the stuff you need to know, but work hard. So sometimes you have to work for free. I've done it before. I've shot images before for a company that I really wanted to work for. I shot them for free. I sent them and said, hey, you can use this. You can have this, but hey, hire me to do more. And I've had some success with that. We talked about connecting to the creative community. Uh, you know, in the end, excellence overcomes everything. Excellence and hard work. 
I think those two things together overcome everything. You can say, well, I don't have any money, I don't have this, but hey, if you work hard and you're really good at what you want to do, and then you, you just work hard to sell what you want to do, you will succeed in this industry. You truly will. But it takes a lot of hard work. It really does. Okay. So, the last thing in this, though, the principle that I've, I've learned from the beginning here, and that is that you can't change enough in the creative industry. Uh, you just can't change fast enough. Uh, because what happens is your generation sees the world differently than mine did. You know, so your generation wants visuals to be different. My generation was very established strobe and very controlled lighting. Your generation is very loose and very, very run and gun and, and window light and just a different world. Uh, the light looks different. The creative approach looks different. So you're going to have to change in this industry. You will not find a success point where you say, okay, I've arrived, I'm done. So I've had some bad years. I've had some bad multiple years where I'm just, I'm not getting it. You know, I'm not able to change enough. And I've got to change. I've got to retool myself. I've got to reintroduce myself to the market. It's definitely a, a changing process. And what does everyone hate the most? Everyone hates change the most. It's a hard thing to do. But it is, you have to decide that that's going to be your life if you're in the creative industry, if you want to stay on top. Uh, make time for family. I tell this story always because I, I have done my, I've worked my hardest uh, to be there where my kids are at and what they're doing. I have four children. I have a son and three daughters. I remember one time my son said, Dad, I'm playing the violin tonight. I really want you to be there. And Dad, you're always late. You know, you're always late. And I'm going, hi, I'm so sorry. I will be there. He said, Dad, it starts at 7. Don't be late. I said, I'll be there. I'll be there. I promise. I'm on set. You know, I can't get the shot done. And the art director's there who flew in from New York. And what do I say to him? You know, see ya. I've got to go to my son's violin concert. You know, <laughs> and I'm just, I'm dying. And I'm dying. I'm looking at the clock and I'm going, it's, it's 5 to 7. You know, I got a 20 minute drive here. You know, it's five after, it's ten after seven, you know, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm just, I'm just feeling like the worst father in the entire world, you know. And then he, I finally get him out the door. I get out the door. I run as fast as I can. I run into this auditorium, and there's my son on his violin. Everyone's playing their violin, and I'm going, ah, I missed the whole stinking thing. You know, and I go to him, Jared, I am so sorry. He goes, for what, Dad? I told you seven, but it doesn't start till 7.30. <laughs> so... Make time for family, and family will have to make time and accommodate for you. I work for an individual right now, I work with an individual right now whose wife was raised in a family where dinner was at 5 o'clock every single night. And she cannot figure why he doesn't get home till 7.30 or 8 or 9. It just, it drives her crazy. It's, it's a lot of contention in their uh, marriage and in their life. So know that when you, you get into this process that it's as much about your family as it is you, my children worked at the studio just like, uh, you know, farm kids work on the farm. You know, they hated it. Oh, do I have to be in another photograph for Procter & Gamble's again? You know, it's like, you know, kids would kill for this. You know? <laughs> but uh, that was life. That's what they did. But uh, my wife and I have had a great journey together. The best decision I've ever made was marrying her because she's a graphic designer and she's the love of my life. And we just work well together. We love being together. We work together 24-7. We truly do. Uh, she produces my, my photography, she produces my video, uh, we travel together, and it's just a great experience. We buy the same stupid hats together. So, <laughs> that was when we were in Maine last year. And last of all, I, I, my entire family, my little granddaughter said, Papa, this is not a good photograph for girls to take. <laughs> she did not like the mustache thing at all. <laughs> I thought it was funny. So, Any questions that you have? Yes. It is. My mother, I was going to be given the initials J.P., P, just J.P., and last minute my mom thought, oh, what if they try to give him a name if he goes into the army or something? So she put an A.Y. in there, but I've always gone by J.P. That's all I know is J.P. And I always tell people I have too much of the name and not enough of the money, so. <laughs> my question to you is, with this, with this world of Photoshop and all of this, how do you keep yourself, I guess, exclusive and relevant because there's so many people who could do it through Photoshop, yet you're doing it with the stat of live. Okay, well, I'll answer this question like this. How many people here uh, have got married in the last five years, ten years? Raise your hand. Anybody got married in the last ten years? So how many of you knew the wedding photographer you were going to get? You knew it ahead of time? Anybody else? Well, I don't, this isn't the right demographic, but I'll give you this. I, I'm missing the point here. So it's interesting to me. There are so many photographers in the world, and they are everywhere until you need one, and then you don't know who to call. 
you don't have any idea who to call. If you had to get, if you had to have wedding photographs tomorrow, would you know who to call? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> See, and that's because we've had an experience together. So the reality is that there's so many photographers in the world, but they don't create experiences with the people around them. As soon as you start creating experiences with the people around you, you become the person they call. You become the person. So it's not about how much you know. It's about how much you network. It's about how much you reach out to other people. It's about how you grow the people around you that know you. And then when they think of a, photo a photographer, they think of you. And so, but it is hard to keep up with all the stuff. You know, I'm going, oh, got to learn Lightroom, got to learn this, got, you know, it just goes on and on. I can't keep up with all of them. I don't edit my own stuff. I just, I don't have the patience to edit. It drives me crazy. So I have a full-time editor. She just edits everything that we shoot, and that's been a really good thing. So, but it's a, rel a very relative question. It really is. It's a hard thing. So, how much of what you do is creative, and how much of it is business? Great question. If I shoot, like I just shot a project for Bulbhead. I think it's up already online, or it's on. It's a TV commercial, and Bulbhead is a weird. You buy all kinds of of uh, inexpensive uh, things that don't work. But uh, <laughs> hey, they worked for the first three minutes. But uh, I spent two weeks producing that, getting the locations, and doing uh, two. Well, about a week and a half, and then we shot for two days, and then we spent a day cleaning it up. So it's almost two weeks. It was a half of my month, and I just shot for two days. So there's estimating and invoicing and getting the talent and putting everything together. So it is fascinating. Most people think every day is I just run in and I shoot pictures and have a great time. But the reality is you're doing about 80 or 90 percent business and, and all the paperwork to kind of keep that whole machine moving ahead. So it's, very, it's a lot of that kind of work. And you can get people to do some of that, but a lot of it you have to do yourself. Other questions? All right. Very good. Go ahead. Wow, the best and worst moments of my career. The best moment of my career, I was photographing um, a thing for Lever Brothers. We had built this huge set. It cost us thousands of dollars. I was in New York City, and the art director said, you are incredible. And I thought, you know what? This is Lever Brothers. It's New York City. It was like The whole thing was like $150,000 for the project we were doing back in the 90s. And I thought, you know what? I feel like I've kind of arrived here. You know? And the worst moment of my life? I had been sick. I hadn't worked for a year because of an operation I'd had. And my rep that uh, handled my film, I, I had a, a three-picture deal at MGM at one point. I was trying to do a, a feature. And uh, the front door of my studio opened. I was the only person there. And the guy dropped my portfolio in on the floor. And I went down and picked it up. And it was my rep saying, we will no longer be representing you. And at that moment, my career, <laughs> my feature career was kind of like, I heard the toilet flushing, <laughs> and there it went. So, you know, it's the highs and lows. It's when people hire you, you just think, oh, man, I'm amazing. You know, I'm amazing. And then when people don't hire you, they think, oh, my word, I'm such, I don't have a clue what I'm doing. You know, so it's, it's that kind of an art all the time. All right. Any other questions? Who's the, who are they pointing at? Go ahead. You know, what, what I learned at Art Center that was pivotal for me was I really learned how to light there. And I learned an appreciation for lighting. Uh, there's a, a teacher there, Charlie Potts, and I'm about to recreate some of the stuff he taught us in our classes on my YouTube channel. Uh, Charlie Potts, just he understood light. And uh, it's, it, that was really, for me, the most important thing. I also learned, though, I got to see other working professional photographers because all their teachers at nighttime are working professional photographers. So you would go to their studios. You'd see them, hear them talk about their shoots. And so I started to feel like, oh, this is not so hard. You know, this feels achievable. You know, I didn't, it didn't feel so mysterious. It felt very achievable. And that was really, that was really important for me, especially coming from Idaho. I was freaked out about being in L.A. and, you know, an Idaho boy. And, you know, it's like, I don't know. Uh, for film, there's there's a couple of books that are out there, and I, I will try to. I'm not going to remember the exact name of them. There's a, it's called Shot by Shot. is a great book that just gives you a, a sense of how to break down a scene, how to put it together. That's a fabulous book. And there's also another one on directing. I can't remember the full name of this book. Uh, there's a great book called The Artisan Way that I think every person who's going to be in in the world, yeah, that's a fabulous book because that that just gives you a sense of the artist's journey. And it's a great book. But there's some great books out there. I'll try to look that up. I'll put that up on my YouTube channel. I'll answer that question on there. It'd be a good thing to do. So. Has your website played a, a big role in your success uh, in terms of being a digital profile and a way for you to reach new 
new clients and expand your horizons in your business? Absolutely. Uh, when I started out, it was a portfolio, Transparent, transparency portfolio. You would ship it to FedEx to whoever you want, you know. And now, no one wants a portfolio. Any, no one. They want to see your website. They look at your website, and so that website's got to be up to date. It's got to be several things. It's got to load quickly. You know, an art director is going, I need a photographer. I've got to look at 10, 20 people today. And if the minute your first image goes, next person. I mean, it's that crucial, it's that critical. And so web pages are incredibly important. So you think students now at the college that are doing work should be creating digital profiles of their work on their website so in the future they can show them to prospective employers? Absolutely. That gal that was doing this shot, all this stuff for Pinterest, she made $40,000 in la last year doing, and she's not even trying. But that's because she created this whole world, you know, uh, and... It's like she's got it online, she's got a website, she's got a, a very active Instagram account. Yeah, you, if you have a body of work right now and you're starting to move ahead, you absolutely should get on a website and start creating your, your world. It's never too late. Uh, it's interesting, and I say this a lot when I teach and when I mentor, and that is that there's somebody for everybody, and that's not a marriage statement. It's that there's, there's a photographer and there's a person who needs photography. You know, and so there's somebody that will match you and your skill level and where you're at today if you have any kind of a point of view at all. So get it out there. Get your web page going. Start creating that, that look and that, that experience and start talking to your friends and people around you. And pretty soon you'll have people who are paying you to, to do photography work. So there's somebody for everybody. Not everyone's going to hire you to do the next Vanity Fair uh, ads. You know, it's. I, I don't want to hog it too much more. No, you're fine. This generation is the video generation. Yours was pretty much the still, still generation. So a, a category that I, I don't think has been thought about is the resume, rather than being the paper resume or just the digital version, should be the video resume to go with the digital profile at your website where you present your image to prospective employers, right? So students Absolutely. On your contact page, to have a video introduction about who you are and what you do is a fabulous idea. Actually, I'm going to steal that. I don't have that. So thank you. <laughs> But you know, you're absolutely right because that's that's what that's why the BTS thing that I started doing behind the scenes of here's one of my shoots was great because art directors are going, we want to see how you work, we want to see what you do, and that that's what started the whole slant of lens. Is the slant of lens was like showing, well, this is what I do, this is how I work, this is how I take a picture, this is how I work with the model. You know, I'm not a jerk, I'm not throwing my cameras at the ground, you know, and I'm not screaming at everybody, you know, it's, and so it just creates that they get a sense of who you are and what you can do. Absolutely. You know, it's really important uh, to create. I think you can't start this soon enough. If you, you may grow and change. If you have this sense of, I want to be a high-end uh, whatever photographer, then create that site and create images that look like that. And look at other sites that look like that and make sure yours look like that. But then if you're saying, well, I'm not going to get that work very fast, then create another site called Sloppy Photography. And sloppy photography just does whatever it can. And you put pictures on there, it'll get people to do their engagements. They get people on there that are going to do your this. I think you can have two or three sites that sell to different people at different times in your career. And let sloppy photography help you make enough money to get to the point where you can do the high-end stuff that you want to do. Uh, it just becomes a, a growing experience. I'm, you know, for me, it was very a turnkey. I went from... This, I went from Art Center into very high-end work, and it was truly blessed. It was because of the advertising we did and because we had spent the money to create that work when we were in school. And so if you're creating that kind of work now, get it out there. I've taken up too much time, so I apologize. No, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? I'll end on that. Digital? Oh, I've been shooting digital forever. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I love film, and I love that process, but the minute digital came out, I couldn't do it fast enough. You know, not a lot. I shoot digital the way I shoot film, and that is it's 99% there when I take the picture, and I still light it and fix it. I just shot some stuff in Gaysburg or Lincoln. Sun's going down, light's dropping, and I, what's that? Yeah, and I've got three lights going on set, and, I've got, and I'm shooting like crazy, and, but I'm digitized. Oh, when I shoot these things on 4x5 sheet film, shooting Polaroids, and then you send your 50 sheets to the lab, and you just pray that everything looked good, you know? And so when digital came out, I'm going, it looks good. I mean, I can sleep tonight. You know, <laughs> that was the greatest day of my life. So the last time I tried to shoot film, I sent it over to the lab I've used for 20 years. And my assistant says, hey, lab's not here anymore. I'm going, come on, it's gotta be there. It's right there. No, it's not here. And he sends me a picture. We're closed, <laughs> we're out of business. So, so, but I am going to start shooting a sheet of film every time I do my digital stuff now. 
as a here's a film and just as film's got a great resurgence your generation is doing it they want to shoot film it's that that retro experience they want to go back and shoot film again which is fabulous i think it's such a great thing but you know what in a in a working professional world it just doesn't work it's just not fast enough and last question Five D Mark III is a big jump, but if you're going to do photography and you're really serious about it, then at least get yourself into a low-end Rebel. You can buy those used online. That gives you the ability to control your aperture and your shutter, and you can. That really gives you the, an introduction to the world of photography. And it's a decent digital image. It's a crop sensor, which will change your lenses a little bit, but still, it's a great entry point. I know people making a ton of money with little Rebels, actually, because if, if, if people love what you shoot, then they pay you to shoot what you did. They don't care how you got there, you know. If it's the iPhone, they don't care. I mean, they're starting to, people are starting to prove that, you know, so. All right, well, thank you very much. It was great to be here. Um, we are very appreciative of you coming out here. And to show our appreciation, we got you this really beautiful plaque. So oh, hopefully fabulous. you can put this up. Well, thank and, you. Uh, enjoy it. So, thank you very much. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. you. That's so sweet, I appreciate it.